If you want your playing to feel smooth, relaxed, and professional, you need to avoid rushing at all costs. But the problem is that our hands tend to push ahead, even when we tell ourselves to lay back. What's cool though is we can use intentional physical motion to fill the space between notes, helping us avoid rushing. This can actually work wonders for helping your playing relax and your backbeats feel more professional. We all want to sound more professional. This is how you do it. You can do this. Hey, welcome to the Non-Glamorous Drummer. I'm all about helping you become the drummer everybody wants to play with. That confident musical drummer who is just laying it down, who is reaching their goals, and really becoming the drummer that they're made to be. And we do this by teaching you the core drumming skills that really matter, that help you get results fast. And hey, I bet you're wanting to nail grooves and fills and basically be able to play whatever you want to play on the drums and nail any song you want to play. But there's a problem, and that big problem that so many of us face is that you have a weak hand that's wreaking havoc on literally everything you try to play. And you're not able to play fills smoothly, and backbeats aren't really feeling good because that weak hand just isn't executing like it should. The worst problem is that many of us have just settled for this and have come to believe that maybe our weak hand is not capable of as much as our strong hand, but that cannot be further from the truth. I believe that your weak hand is just as capable. You've just got to practice the right things. You've got to be patient with it and be diligent, but you can definitely even out your hands. I have a solution for you. The free mini course I want you to go enroll in right now. It's called Eliminate Your Weak Hand in Three Steps. This is a really cool, detailed, transformative method that I've been teaching to my one-on-one -on -one students for years and it's delivered results in student after student so that they've got balanced hands, they're playing musical, smooth, confident fills around their kit, and they're no longer having to worry about the weak hand. This is huge, this is super helpful. We talk about detailed mechanics. A lot of times little issues going on with your weak hand that you didn't even know were there. When you fix that, sky's the limit. So, I want this for you. I want you to even out your hands. This is going to help also with our lesson today. If you eliminate your weekend, that's going to help a lot with this whole backbeat thing we're talking about today. So go dive in. There's a link at the top of the description so you can go sign up to the free course right there. All right, on with today's lesson. So today we're pretty much breaking this whole lesson down into three main points. First thing is I'm going to share with you the biggest reason why I believe we tend to rush. And then I'm gonna share with you the stick motion, the specific stick motion that really helps lay back your back piece for more professional feel. And then third thing, we're gonna talk about exactly how to practice this and the exact tempos to work it at and the really the detailed nitty gritty step by step so you know exactly what to work on to master this and have a much more professional, solid laid back kind of feel. So let's dig right in. So here's what I believe is the most common reason why we rush. Now. There are a lot of potential reasons why we can rush. So many factors can go into this, but I think this is probably the biggest one in most cases. And it's that we want to fill space and close gaps, causing us to rush backbeats. Most of the time, regardless of the tempo of a song, most of the time what's causing a drummer to rush is that as that drummer's grooving along, they're hitting the backbeats a little too early. And if you start hitting backbeats a little early, then most likely your next kick note's gonna come a little bit early and then probably your timekeeping hand is gonna follow. And so it kind of causes this like falling down the stairs, maybe not that dramatic in all cases, but kind of that tripping over yourself kind of feeling where each backbeat's a little bit early, so okay, then each downbeat ends up being rushed a little bit, then each following backbeat gets rushed. And by the way, when I say backbeat, I'm talking about hitting the snare on two and four. When you're playing a groove and you're going boom, ba, boom, boom, ba, Ah, those snare hits are backbeats. Most rock grooves, funk grooves, uh, most fusion, mo most, most things besides like jazz and Latin, most styles of music that we play, there's going to be some kind of backbeat in the groove, whether it's a big snare hit or whether it's a cross stick or something a little gentler. But that's what the backbeat is. And that's something we're playing all the time. It's something we definitely want to get very comfortable doing. And it's so easy to rush that. So what we're doing today is breaking down a, a specific stick motion you can do that helps you make sure you land those backbeats in time so that they don't rush, so that you have a nice relaxed feel that's super solid, so that your time is better, so that you sound more professional, honestly. So here's how this works. This is the stick motion that lays back your backbeats for a much more professional feel. And it's this whole concept of doing upstrokes. The idea is that we don't wanna just go, or we don't wanna just smack the snare. Boom, boom, ba, boom, 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 ba. Because if we do that, there's not really, it's kind of haphazard. We kind of have to get lucky and hope that we hit the snare at exactly the right time. But if we do a prep stroke and there's some strategy and some intentional thought going into lifting the stick and then coming down, and so this whole motion leading up to that actual note, 
then that's actually going to give us a much higher chance of landing the actual note on the snare in time. So really we can break this down into four steps, four points of motion. And the first one is this. Whenever you're not actually playing, you want to have your stick at a resting point about right here. There's a few reasons for that. One is so that we can then go and go like that if we're breaking this down in slow motion. But also so that if you want to play ghost notes in the midst of that groove, your stick is down here close to the drum ready to do that. Now, the, the ghost note discussion is a discussion for another lesson, so we're not going to go into that. But that's an additional reason why you want to keep your stick down here when you're not in the middle of playing. So once you play, you want to bring your stick back down to that starting position. So that's our step one, having the stick right down here. Step two is we begin lifting the wrist. So the wrist begins coming up. It's almost like we're hinging the stick right here. It's kind of like there's a pivot point in a way. So we're hinging up, but the tip is staying down here. Then the third thing we want to do is kind of, I say whip, but it's like a gentle kind of whipping motion. Then we're going like bringing the tip of the stick up so that now we're going like this. And so it means our arm might be going down a little bit because now the tip is going up. So we're lifting in preparation for step number four, which is whipping the stick down. And of course, the amount of energy we put into that depends on how hard we're wanting to hit, whether or not we're really whipping it down or we're just gently letting it fall down. That's going to be determined by how loud we're trying to play. Regardless, that motion is true though. So step one, we're down here. Stick is just, tip is just above the head. Step two, we begin lifting the wrist. Step three, we lift the tip. Step four, we go down. And that's really all there is to this. It's almost, it's kind of like, you know, as a conductor is conducting, there's a distinct pattern of motion to that pattern. Like this right here would be a basic four, four conducting pattern where you're going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And so there's a very distinct pattern of motion the interesting thing is that from a conductor standpoint, because there is a motion to it, that actually helps the conductor stay more in time. Yes, the conductor needs to have a good internal sense of time and needs to practice with a metronome, but when there's a, a motion going on like this, it's pretty easy to keep this in tempo and just keep this going steadily, just like if you're bouncing a basketball, just like if you're walking, you're going to walk at a steady pace. So there's a lot of power behind motion, and so we want to use motion to our advantage. So here's how you can practice this exact stick motion at every tempo. Because what we want to think about is, well, what part of the beat are we doing these motions on? How early do we want to be up here so that we come down here? Because honestly, that's the most important part. So I've shown you what the motion is, but now we need to know how to implement it and how we're actually going to do this when we're playing a groove. So let's talk about 60 beats a minute, because a lot of times if we're playing a really slow groove, 60 beats a minute is, a, is probably a pretty common, very slow ballad tempo. And if we're playing at 60, it's really easy to rush if we're honest with ourselves. And so if we can get this happening, get our backbeats laying back at 60 beats a minute, then we know we're going to be just fine at 70 and at 80 and so on. And we'll talk about some things that change as we get faster. But for now, let's focus on those slow tempos. So we know that our step one is having the tip just above the head. What we want to do is begin moving our wrist a quarter note before the backbeat. So if we're playing one, two, three, four, one, two, like that, we want to begin that motion on beat one and on beat three, since we're also hitting on four. But if we're just looking at that beat two hit, beat one, we want to start lifting the wrist. And the idea is that we want to have the tip of the stick arrive at that upward position, an eighth note before that note. So that means the and of one. So we could think about this simply as one and two. We begin the upward motion here on one, we make sure the tip arrives up here on the and, and then we're striking the drum on two. One and two. Now this isn't a uh, 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 like that kind of motion. It's not a robotic one and two, making sure that you're hitting these specific points of travel at specific times. That's not really the goal because this needs to become a fluid motion. But if you take this fluid motion and you put mile markers on it, based on like, okay, where's the, where the hand here? Where's the stick here? That's pretty much what you end up with. And that's what you wanna aim for. And I found that in analyzing what I'm doing as I'm playing this, I always find that the tip of the stick is up here, kind of crossing this threshold, always on the and before that backbeat. So what's happening here is the path of downward travel is filling the eighth note space before that backbeat. So if you've had a tendency to rush backbeats, they're always wanting to happen a little bit early, well, now it's almost like you've got a buffer. You could think about this as a buffer, like a safety net, a cushion, however you want to think of this, because now you've got this eighth note's worth of travel time that has to happen before that note actually happens. 
And unless you're hitting extremely hard, you don't have to whip the stick down really hard. It can just be a gentle falling in a way. One and two and three and four. And as long as you're up here on that and, there's enough distance that the stick has to travel that most likely you're not going to hit that backbeat early. Now the question might be, well, Stephen, what if I'm not playing super loud because you're doing this big dramatic motion? And when you're practicing on a practice pad, definitely do that. Go ahead and do the big dramatic motion, hit your practice pad, it's nice and soft, it's not loud. But when I take the pad off and now we're hitting a snare, we don't necessarily need a huge motion if we're not trying to hit really hard. But something that I want you to become accustomed to, and this is kind of a, a potential tangent we could go down, but also just a, a side note thing to keep in mind across the board when you're playing drums, that you want to use stick height, you want to use stick height to your advantage no matter what you're hitting and regardless of your volume. So even if you're playing softly, you wanna play in a manner that allows you to go. That's how you have a smoothness and a nice fluidity to your playing when it's kind of that lethargic boom, boom, ba, boo, da, boo, da, where the sticks are just floating from drum to drum. And we do that by allowing that stick height, by allowing that motion where we're not really hitting the drums, we're kind of just dropping the stick on the drum. Literally just gently dropping it on the rack tom for a nice, light, warm kind of sound. Of course, on the floor tom, there's not a lot of rebound there, but that's okay. On the snare, same thing applies. If we're playing lightly, I'm not hitting the snare, I'm just gently dropping the stick. And so kind of side note, side tangent, that is a huge key to playing well quietly when you've got to play in a small room in a small venue. That's so important to get out of the mindset of hitting things and playing like this, and instead get in the mindset of using that gentle whipping motion, because it is kind of a whipping motion, but we're not hitting hard. It's like we're floating the stick up, letting it gently drop down. And if you maintain that kind of mindset going from drum to drum, one and two and three and where we're reaching that arc point up we're, we're hitting the upstroke on the and then you just float from drum to drum and you can gently drop the stick and you can play so lightly but have this smooth kind of fluidity in your playing that's so important and that's such an important thing to practice that i think is very underrated it's not something that's talked about much it's not something we really tend to want to practice because it's it's kind of mundane it's kind of non-glamorous but it's very important so if you're playing more softly, it's okay to not have a huge dramatic motion. It might look like this. Where I'm kind of just pushing the stick over the edge, like raising it and just giving it a little nudge, letting it fall. If I'm trying to play lightly in a small room, I don't want to go any louder than that. Same steps of motion apply though. One and two. That motion starts on one. It's not a lot. It's not a strong sudden motion on one. It's a gentle motion. One and, and we're up here by the and, and two. One and two and three and four and And after we play that backbeat, the stick's bouncing, but then we're bringing it back into place here. After it bounces, we bring it back into place an inch or so above the head, so we're ready to repeat that, and so that we can insert ghost notes if we wanted to. Which, like I said, is a topic for another video, getting into the technique of playing ghost notes, but that's just an additional purpose of keeping the stick there low to the drum. Now, as you begin increasing tempo, you can maintain this whole, the, the same motion structure, uh, probably until you're up to like 120. Because even when you're at 100, one and two, and three and four, and one and two, we're still doing that same up on the and, so the motion starts the beat before, one and two, and three and four, and one and two. Same thing's gonna apply. And I found that when you get to about 120, 130, you start to get really quick. That's where you can then begin aiming to have the upstroke a quarter note before. So if we're going like 160, if we're going like 160, I don't have a metronome going, but it's something like this. At that tempo, we want to have the upstroke a quarter note before. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it kind of becomes this up and down movement. And of course, as you go really fast, then you end up just going bump, 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 where it becomes this steady motion and you don't have to break down individual points of motion because there's not much space between the backbeats. 
So at that point, this whole discussion isn't quite as important because you're less likely to rush a backbeat when you're going really fast. The point is, you can use this whole one and two and three and four and one and two three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two, all the way up to 120, 130, probably when you get to, let's see, 140, but boom, 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 one and two and three and four and one and two. It's still kind of a lift on the and, but we start to blur things a little bit. That's why I think by the time you're at 150 or so, it becomes more of the upstroke happening on the beat. So what you have to do is not get too hung up on like the exact, oh, I need to make sure I have this right here on the end. Don't worry too much about that as you go faster. Know that it's okay for it to become that more fluid, blurring kind of motion where that can happen a little bit earlier to make sure you're hitting that backbeat on time. And honestly, the, the biggest thing that I can tell you right now is don't overthink this because I know this is a super analytical, detailed look at something very simple that needs to not be overthought. I know that a lot of you guys are like the engineering mind. You're the analyzing kind of mind. That's, that's kind of the way I am. I like to think through things and I like to know what's going on. And so for you guys, I know it's not all of you, but for you guys who are that kind of brain, I know that the tendency is gonna to be to overthink this and to worry too much about it. What I want you to do is practice doing everything I've shown you, go through these steps, but let this become a very smooth, fluid motion where remember, just think of it as a gentle whipping, a gentle lifting and then dropping the stick when you're playing softly. It's not really a whipping unless you're playing very loudly and let it become a natural smooth motion because what you're gonna find is that the more you do this, the more natural and smooth it becomes where you can just play. Practice it open-handed too. Do this with your right hand. Don't just do this with your left. I know that a challenge of this is that we're talking weak hand. We're doing this with our left hand, which is the weak hand for many of us. It might actually be easier to start this with your right hand. Practice doing this with your right hand and then get your left hand to do the same. But once you've gone through those four steps, once you've figured out, okay, here's what's going on, let that become a blurred, smooth, fluid motion. Don't overthink it. Know that the whole goal here is to have a motion that leads you up to the actual creation of the sound, the actual hitting of the drum so that you're able to hit those backbeats exactly in time and even lay them back. If you wanna create a feel that's kinda of like. Where it's almost like a even laid back backbeat where it kinda of feels like the backbeat's pulling things and maybe the, the kick drum pushes a little bit and the backbeat lays back. It's so much easier to do cool things like that when there's something physical that's taking the burden off of your brain. Because when you're having to sit there and you're having to think really hard about, oh, I gotta stay in time. Oh, I need to lay this back slightly. Oh, I need to make sure this doesn't rush. When you're having to think through all those details, things get messy and it's hard to make music. But when you can physically make your body do what needs to happen in order to create a feel, in order to create a certain kind of timing and feeling in a groove, that, that honestly takes a burden off of your brain. It takes a burden off your ear too, because then you can just relax into it. And so when you're moving in that kind of relaxed motion, things are going to feel better. Things are gonna feel more in time, in the pocket, relaxed and even laid back without you having to think so much about it. And that's what I want for you here. That's the big goal, that's the big win from this lesson. Now, before we wrap up, there is a huge prerequisite skill you must have in order to do any of this. And if, if you've watched many of my videos, you know we end up landing on something like this with a lot of lessons because this is so important. Something we didn't talk about today was the details, the mechanics of exactly how you need to be gripping your stick. There are other videos here on the channel about that. It, it, this is one of those things that deserves its own lesson and even its own course, but that's fine because I have a free mini course for you. It's called Eliminate Your Weak Hand in Three Steps. I told you about this earlier. I want you to go sign up for that. It's free, you got nothing to lose. We break down all the details of exactly how you need to be gripping your stick. And the whole point of this is to go through the three main steps that we've got to go through to even out our hands so that you can play balanced singles that result in balanced fills. And if you don't get your left hand evened out, you're probably going to struggle to actually do these backbeats very well. And so that's why this really is a prerequisite to this lesson. If you're having any trouble at all right now, if you're having trouble with fills, if your left hand is incapable, you've got to check out this course, three steps to eliminating your weak hand. This is a super transformative method that I've taught to all of my one-on-one -on -one students. And it's amazing the results that they get when they start working on these little details and fixing tiny issues that they didn't know were there in their left hand. And then suddenly things start freeing up and suddenly the hand-to-hand -hand coordination comes together. Suddenly they're playing fills. 
and they realize, oh, you know what? My left hand is capable of doing what my right hand is doing. Sometimes we spend so many years and even decades of settling for a weak left hand that we just, we forget that the left hand is capable of doing what the right hand has been doing. We've just got to target the right things and work on the right things. And that's my whole goal in this course, to show you the exact correct things to work on with your left hand so that this becomes way easier. So I want you to join the course. It's totally free. Go check it out. The link is at the top of the description. As always, everyone, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for hanging out today. I hope you got a lot out of this lesson. I like simple lessons like this that have huge wins though. So I'm eager to hear about how this helps you out with laying back your backbeats, being nice and in the pocket, sounding way more professional. That's something very cool that we all need to be striving for. So I hope this helps you out. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. Be sure to go enroll in that mini course. Hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. I'll see you on the next lesson.